need? Actually, I have uh, pineapple ghost pepper in my basement now. Really? How did how did it turn out? Um, it's it's coming out. I I like the pineapple. What I did with the pineapple was I uh, cut up the pineapple in the spring, and uh, I filled a three liter jar with the pineapples that I cut up, and I put honey on top of it, and the honey pulled out the moisture in the pineapples. So it was almost like a lacto fermentation. Oh, interesting. So then I took the pineapples out of the syrup, the pineapple syrup. And they used the pineapple syrup. Uh, one day I had people over. I chopped up the pineapples and I reserved the syrup. So I pasteurized the syrup. I put it in mason jars and heated it up to 170 degrees. And I used that as the flavoring for my, uh, the pineapple flavoring for my, for my meat. And then I went in later and added the ghost peppers to get the flavor that I wanted. Interesting. So that was was that a five gallon batch? Yeah, I do a lot with uh, with fruit like that. Okay. Like especially like raspberries, blackberries. You could fill a jar with raspberries and blackberries, and just top it with honey. And by the end of the week, the raspberries will all shrivel up, the blackberries will all shrivel up, and you'll have this beautiful blackberry syrup. I have but, never you know, tried yeah. that. That's a neat idea. I've tried it with vodka, not with honey. <laughs> yeah, see, I've done it any number of times with vodka to make cordials, but I've never thought about packing them in honey, and I didn't realize it'd suck all the moisture out of them. Yeah, it's yeah, the well, osmotic pressure, the same out. reason. Yeah, it's the same reason you don't want to dump dry yeast in, into a really high, uh, high specific gravity must. Because what you end up with is a situation where it's trying to pull water, because of the concentration of sugar in the in the solution, it's trying to pull water out of the yeast instead of putting it into the yeast. Interesting. Yeah, I guess I I guess I knew that, but I just never thought about packing, you know, packing it and, you know, packing fruit in honey and then but now okay, no, that makes sense because they used to and this is so gross. Um if somebody died going on a um ship crossing on the ocean, they would sometimes pack them in a barrel of honey until they could get them where to where they could bury them because it would preserve well, it preserves them. It's a preservative, so no I've kid. heard the same story about rum. Mm, yeah, they do it with rum too. But yeah, yeah there's there's the there's actually a guy in a barrel of honey buried in a uh, graveyard somewhere on the Carolina coast, and I can't remember where exactly it is. And the, the this whole story is like in the museum that's nearby. Uh, this guy mm. was traveling across the ocean and he died. So they you know, but he was a he was a muckety muck. He's like a the ship's owner or something like that. And um, they packed him in a barrel of honey and then just buried him right in the barrel. <laughs> You know, and his family plot when they got him there. So, wow. yeah, it was wild. Yeah. It was a neat story. I I ran across it when I was uh, bumming up and down the coast out there when I was doing uh, living history stuff in Manio. So, but yeah, that's really. I'm, I'm going to totally try that when I get home now. <laughs> do you only do that with fr- do you do that with fresh fruit, or have you tried that with preserved like? Yeah, well, I go with what's on sale. You know, oh, okay, so you're just buying store, fruit at the you store. Raspberries or. Pass the farm stand. I can get raspberries, a couple pounds of raspberries. Throw them in a half gallon jar. Fill huh. them up as much as you can. I don't smash them. I don't squish them down and mash them. And I just pour honey on top. Huh. Leave the loose lid, the lid loose. The honey will pull all the moisture right out of the berries. And you're going to end up with a great syrup that you could actually, you know, you could back sweeten of that kind of like a blackberry mead. You could certainly end that for a blackberry mead. Yeah. You to kick it up, but you just have to pasteurize it first. Because any uh, natural yeast that's still there can still be in there. Once the moisture content of the honey goes above 18%, that yeast can get a hold of it. That's why I pasteurized what I put in, in with the pineapples. Well, it makes sense. That's really that's really neat. I'm gonna have to try. It. I'm totally gonna try that when I get home. Now I can see I can see a when whole new enough steps to making me. You have to make one more. Yeah. Well, for me, I'm thinking I, in my mind's eye, I see all these half-gallon jars in the pantry and my husband going, seriously, when are you going to do something with those? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, same thing here. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I know someone who did that with rose petals. Yeah, yeah. I, I've someone done the... Ex- got me did that. I did the extraction when I made my rotamel. I did an extraction of rose petals to put into I mean I, I fermented on rose petals and then I did another extraction to add more rose flavor because when you do the rose petals straight you get that film on the top mm-hmm. that you have to rack out from underneath that you know of rose petal gook yeah pretty much 
I, I don't know if it's like oil in the rose petals or yeah, I guess it would be rose oil then, you know. Yeah, most likely that's oil, yeah. Yeah, it would make sense. Hmm. So that's really neat. So uh, do you ever do – are you still doing sizers, Bob? Yeah, I just did uh, – I made one last year. Uh, uh, what I take is my – off my capping tank. When I cut off the cappings on the on the frames, I save all the cappings and all the honey. And what I do is I dump that into a pot usually, and I put it over a very low flame, and I let it heat up, and the wax will all melt and go on top, and then I'll let – give it 24 hours to cool down, and I'll end up with like a two-inch thick piece of wax – and I end up with some dark honey underneath that's obviously been slightly caramelized. So last year I made a, a bochette out of that. Then I went, it was I think a three gallon batch. Then I went and got four gallons of cider. And I did a reduction. I reduced the four gallons of cider down to about a quart. Dang. And I added that to the bochette mm. with a half a pound of toasted pecans which I toasted in the oven oh my god <laughs> and uh, some vanilla some cinnamon and nutmeg nice okay. that sounds you really know, good that's it. what are, yeah, what, are really nice. what are what are when you you know when the bees put everything in the frame they put a wax capping over the cell oh, okay so this is what you like slice off the top right oh. so I take that hot knife and I cut that off right before I put it in the centrifuge Ah, okay. Wow. Okay, so once you spin, I'm assuming you're you're spinning the honey remnants out of the cappings? Out of the frames. No, the cappings I just take, I put into a pot, I turn on the heat, the wax melts at like 120 degrees or 127 degrees. So all that wax melts and goes to the top of the honey once the honey heats up. Right. So once the honey heats up, you know, you really have to figure out what you want to do with it to taste it. And... I decided to make apple pecan pie last year. Nice. And 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 uh, um, I'll just send my address over for you to send me some. Oh my God, that sounds well, so good. You know, you put that on, you know, a little French oak. And, you know, oh my God, yeah, yeah nice. sounds really good. I may have to see if you'll share that recipe. That sounds amazing. Um, so, what do you do? Well, I was going to ask. Play it back. It's right on the air. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, yeah. Remember, he doesn't write it That's down. That's right. He doesn't write it down. That's true. Okay, yeah. Good point. Um, so the wax floats to the top. Do you? Uh, I'm assuming, obviously, you skim the wax off, but do you do anything with the wax afterwards? I mean, are you saving you know, like and I'm making? Like five blocks. There's always someone who tells me they want to make candles or some other crap or lipstick or chapstick or whatever the hell it is. My, another friend of mine's girlfriend makes soap. She's been coming over for three years to get the wax. It's still waiting for <laughs> <laughs> I love using it as a furniture polish, um, especially when I'm turning up wood on the lathe because you can uh, oh, right. oh, yeah. apply it with friction and it melts it onto the onto the uh, part as you're spinning it on the lathe, and it works just brilliantly as a as a furniture polish. And it's really yeah. good for uh, greasing um, uh, drawer rails too, because like I've got a wooden dresser that it's all wood. There are no none of the metal rails or the wheels in them or anything like that. So you have to grease the drawer rails or they get sticky after a while. Yeah, this right, you would just have to reheat and strain, and it would be perfect for any of that. Get the bee parts out? There are some little pizza bees and wings or whatever that are left over from the hive <laughs> in the wax. Well, next time I come up to New York, I'll have to, uh, you know, give you a holler for I come up in there. <laughs> Bob, yeah, get a block, of, honey, get a block of wax ready. I'll pick it up. I make uh, my own salves and things like that for um, muscle balm and stuff. My daughter and her yeah, and her husband are in the... a little bit of olive oil. It doesn't take much, yeah. I use uh, yeah. coconut oil, too, and that works really good. But, yeah, I make, uh, I make homemade uh, tiger balm because I refuse to pay $7 for a tiny little finger full of it. <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah. It's just ridiculously expensive. That's really that's really neat. I I mean I know there's people out there who are um who are, you know, wanting to do I know I want to do the bee thing. Problem is is that I've been bee bopping around so much I'd be afraid that they'd die on me because I was not home. So David's oh, on the uh, David's on the chat and he says he uses beeswax in his black powder bullet lubricant formula. Yeah. We use uh, we use it when we did uh, pistol black powder pistol, and uh, it's in. There's also beeswax in the lube that we use to to lube our cartridges. 
Hmm. Which is that's another part I'd be looking forward to with is is the honey because I do or is the beeswax because I, I I do a lot of candle making and stuff too. Yeah, you really should have been a hippie. How little you get. Really? Yeah, yeah I, w I wouldn't be that surprised. Because you're only you're only taking off the cappings, right? You're not melting down the whole hive, right? Right. You're only taking off the cappings, and they, and they can only be a couple millimeters thick. Oh. So you probably have, out of the whole season, if you got, you know, six, eight pounds, it'd probably be a lot. You know, for what I have. Well, it's, it's like the equivalent of... Pound, pound and a half off a hive. It's like the equivalent of um, each frame, I guess, would be like one of those uh, beeswax sheets you can buy at the craft store that you roll into candles. Well, I don't use the, I don't use the beeswax sheets. I'm going to be honest with you. I use the pericone. I use the plastic one. I find that when I put them in the centrifuge, the electric centrifuge, if I use the wax sheets, they seem a lot of them seem to come apart and fall apart. Oh no! I, I mean the ones the that you buy. Sheet. I mean the ones that you buy for candle making. I was assuming that like one frame, um, the the sheets that you get at the craft store for candle making are about probably about the same thickness as the cappings you're getting. Which, if you were to no, melt all that down, a lot thicker. those are a lot thicker. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever you ever have to get the honeycomb right in the little square uh, plastic box? Yeah, but it's been the a long time honey. since I've had that. I guess they are fairly thin walled. Yes, they are very thin walled. So, okay. But even so, I mean, you take one of those sheets and you melt it down and it's still not that much honey, not that much beeswax. No, there's not. You don't get, I don't get a lot, you know, at all. Not enough to, you know, to make candles for the year or anything like that. With a hundred highs that you're going to have to have, you might get a sizable amount, but... Yeah. You know, you'll find out after your first year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll have to have her on the show so she can tell us all about it. How many candles did you make? With <laughs> How many candles did I make? How many stings did I get? Yeah, oh, yeah right. Trials and tribulations of a newbie beekeeper. So I have to ask because it's come up a um, a couple of episodes this month, uh, this past month, and we've been having uh, beekeepers on the show. Is uh, what have you looked at that uh, fancy new turn the spigot get the honey hive the the flow hive? Well, actually, this year I uh, I do have a guy I'm mentoring, and he is the owner of one of the football teams. I'm not going to get into who it is. Mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Westchester, and uh, I'm going to have my first dealings with the Flow Hive in the spring. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I would love to have you back to, my, to tell us about one that. Of my mentees. Oh, cool. <laughs> That is really neat because I've heard varying opinions on it. I mean, I think it's fascinating. It certainly looks like a nifty piece of technology, you know, for beekeeping, and and seems like it would uh, um, maybe smooth the path a little bit if people are willing to do that investment if they want to get into bees. Kind of like beekeeping light. Eh, well, you yeah, know. I haven't. I haven't used it yet. You know, keep an open mind. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the the guys the guys that made the flow hive. Um, they re revised a little bit the uh, the the presentation of it because they thought maybe it, it it did seem like beekeeping light, where it really isn't. The only difference is that it makes collecting the honey a little easier, but everything else stays the same. You mm. know, so uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, it's it's interesting. I I, I thought it, it's uh, that flow hive. I hope when you see it in the spring, you like it because here in Miami Beach, it's pretty much the only way I'd be able to keep a hive if I wanted to because uh, there's no way I can you know do you know take it all apart and do all that other stuff um, without well, getting a lot, of people, yeah, a lot of people do have extraction services so you could actually oh. take the box off your honey like tomorrow night I'm giving a talk in Addison County Vermont those people have the people who are president he has an extraction business. People drop off hmm. frames right to his house, and he, you know, he spins them out, and they come back and pick up a bucket later. Huh? Cool. Yeah. Huh. You know, I think I forgot what he charges. It's like twenty-five dollars for the first box, and then two dollars a frame after that. Wow. But you know, you don't really have to spend the money for an extractor. Hmm. So if you only have one or two hives, you know, instead of spending you know a thousand dollars for an extracting a whole extracting setup. Just bring it to him, 
pay him 75 bucks and you go home with a bucket of honey, two buckets of honey. Well, that, that may quit, Finn.